Hi, everybody. Uh, good news and bad news. We'll start with the bad news first. The bad news is that, unfortunately, Carla Madavi is in Italy right now, and the internet is completely down as a result of a giant storm that is blowing through. However, he will be back, hopefully, either tomorrow or Friday. We'll update you. Um, that actually wasn't the good news. Uh, the good news is I have lots of wine, and there's no reason that I can't go live and hang out with you guys. So I thought, because I had a wonderful, wonderful podcast recording this afternoon, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to reveal who it was, but I will tell you it was someone um, who is really recognized in the sports industry and uh, has his own podcast, and he was a lot of fun to talk to. And we had some great wine. So I thought maybe instead of talking about the rain Pinot Noir today, which we will do at a later date, I would grab these two wines and we would taste these. So hopefully that works for you all. I'm sorry about the, uh, the mishap, um, but here we are. I've got alternates and hopefully you're ex as excited to try these with me as I am to share them with you. Uh, two of my favorites, two classics from Napa, two wines that I would definitely consider benchmarks, um, Spotswood Sauvignon Blanc. So what do you need to know about Spotswood? Sorry, I'm just moving all this around because I am live streaming, which is a little bit weird via Zoom. So if my eyes are going back and forth. I'm just trying to like figure all this out. Okay, so Spotswood. Um, here's the label if you guys are curious to see it. Um, this is their 2018 Sauvignon Blanc. Interestingly, Spotswood, though it is an estate in St. Helena and though their, their Cabernet is entirely a state, their Sauvignon Blanc actually is not. They do make a single vineyard Sauvignon Blanc called Mary's Block, um, which is only available to their mailing list. And actually I did record a little video of that wine, me tasting that wine. So that'll come out a little bit later. Um, but this is actually gonna be 60% Sonoma County and 40% Napa County. Um, so I have my handy dandy Corp in here. Spotswood was founded in the early 80s. Um, it has a great story. It was actually founded by a family and it was really the, the patriarch's passion project. He was the one that wanted to, to start a winery and he moved his family to Napa Valley. And unfortunately he passed away really suddenly and left his wife, Mary, um, and their children who were all very young at the time. Um, left them with this property. And so not really knowing what to do in the 70s, late 70s, um, Mary looked at it as an opportunity to borrow from what was happening around the valley, which is really cool. It was a, a time in Napa Valley's history when the sharing economy was very much uh, in play and people were sharing information, sharing vineyard sources. Uh, it was just, it was kind of the golden age of Napa Valley's history. And so Mary initially started um, selling her grapes um, and then in 1982, the very first Spotswood wine was made, uh, and Spotswood is in St. Helena. It is on the western side of St. Helena and a really, really beautiful um, kind of sun-kissed area, but also on um, sort of what we would consider the benchlands of St. Helena. So um, a few other vineyards that are close by that would be notable, you've got Madrona Ranch, uh, which is primarily an Abreu wine, uh, really just right next door. There's a vineyard for Duckhorn. Um, there's also, if you're familiar with Melka's Jumping Goat Vineyard uh, that he uses for the Matisse label, that's adjacent. And then not too far from there, maybe you know a quarter mile as a crow flies, you've got the Capella Vineyard on the other side of the street. Um, over on Spring Street. So it's a really, really cool little area. And Spotswood is kind of in the center of it. If you can see the lay on the front label here, this is actually the house. So this is the house that if you are driving up, uh, what is that, uh, Tanger Street, um, you're driving up and you hit Hudson, that's the Spotswood property. So this is a very old estate. This is actually called the Lindenhurst Estate. Um, and the, the house still stands. It is uh, no longer a family residence, so to speak. Mary did live there until she passed a few years ago. Um, but just a wonderful, wonderful area. Um, it is a Victorian home, as the, as the label is telling me here. But this was Mary, the, the matriarchs. It was her wine. She loved the Sauvignon Blanc that they made. Um, also, very interestingly, Spotswood is the very first uh, or, or one of the first certified organic wineries, certified organic vineyards in Napa Valley. So they have been farming organically 
since the late 80s and certified since the early 90s and continue to really steward the land in a way that is responsible um, and wonderful. And we just love everything that they do. Um, so I will say I tasted this earlier and it was, you know, Sauvignon Blanc can take on a lot of, a lot of personalities, a lot of characteristics, uh, depending on where it's grown. It's a very versatile grape, although there are a few notable characteristics of this, of this particular grape, always going to get some sort of a, a, a lemon lime, maybe a little tropical, maybe a little grapefruit. Um, but this to me actually has a really distinct smell to it. And hopefully this won't gross you guys out, but this is uh, one of your one of your classic markers, especially with like New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and with Sancerre is this, um, some people call it like cat pee. And so it smells a little like litter box. And if you've ever smelled like a really, really aromatic Sauvignon Blanc that hasn't really seen a ton of oak, you know, it's really kind of the, the pyrazine of the grape coming through that greenness, um, that is that smell. So really, really aromatic. I don't think it's, it's in a bad way. And I think that that term is a little bit pejorative and it's not intended to be, but it is sort of one of these identifying markers of something on Blanc. So on the nose, tons of that. And then you get a, a lot of minerality, a lot of wet stone, not too much floral, not too much in the way of grapefruit, but it definitely like, if you think about this wine as a color and it is a little bit leading because you can see there's actually like some green tinges to it. It's kind of hard to see with the lighting here, but it's a very green wine. And Sauvignon Blanc tends to, if you were to assign a color to it, I always assign the color green or yellow. Um, green is the one that strikes me here and it's really herbaceous. It's very aromatic. Uh, it's very lifted, it's very bright. And I think it's why people love it for the summertime because it you know, feels like a, a lemon lime soda or things that you would normally drink in warm weather. Um, it being hot and humid where I am today, uh, not really surprising that this is going down real easy. And my guest on the podcast, uh, which by the way, I should mention, um, the podcast has not officially been released yet. It is called Wine Access Unfiltered. Um, I'm really, 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 really excited about it. And I think you guys will be too. We've got some amazing guests that are not in the wine world, but have great wine stories. So um, do look out for that. That should be coming up in about two weeks or so. But on the palette, you know, a really bright kind of um, lemon, lime, a little bit more of that greenness, but great kind of like prickly pear on the palate. You know, it has that sort of phenolic tension. Um, those are two words that are a little bit geeky, but bear with me, phenolic tension. So what does that mean? Um, if you've ever bitten into a fruit, like specifically a pear, right? You know, that skin, you know, it has that sort of prickliness on your tongue. Uh, that's a, that's phenolics or tannin, right? But for a white wine, uh, white wines don't sit on their skin. So they don't really have tannin in the way that red wine does, but you still can get sort of this phenolic bitterness or phenolic tension. Um, and for me, that's what I get on the wine here. There's a little bit of that like prickly pear skin. Uh, and, and so I, I think phenolic tension is a really great word for it because it does feel like it's kind of pulling in your mouth and it leaves a little bit of an impression, but it's not weighty You know, it kind of lifts back up and it's, it's a really beautiful, beautiful wine. This is very light body, but it does have really nice texture to it for a Sauvignon Blanc. I don't believe it sees any sort of new French oak. Sauvignon Blanc typically doesn't see any new French oak unless it's a really high quality one. So generally speaking, the more expensive the Sauvignon Blanc, the more likely you are to, uh, for it to have uh, been oaked, in which case the Sauvignon Blancs are gonna be a little bit broader, um, still have some, some of that lemon lime, that minerality and that crispness that a lot of times it's got that sort of undercurrent of baking spices and vanilla, a little bit of texture, a little bit of weight. Um, things that you might normally associate with with Chardonnay. So for people that really want to move from Chardonnay to Sauvignon Blanc, an oak Sauvignon Blanc is a good segue into there. But like I said, more than likely your Sauvignon Blancs that are going to be in this like 20 to $50 category, more than likely not seeing any sort of oak, more than likely it's going to be new, uh, used French oak barrels, if anything. Um, occasionally you get your cigar barrels or a little bit of cement, but a lot of times it's just stainless steel. And that's kind of what gives it that crispiness um, that we love about serving a block. I'll take one more sip. I apologize if you can hear things in the background. This is a very full house right now. I am at home. Um, and uh, it's about six o'clock, as you guys know, because you're watching this live, and it is phone call central around here. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Aromatically, I felt this wine earlier when I tasted it was just like in my face, and now I feel like it's toned down. Now this is a wine that I'm really excited to like 
go hang by the pool with, but it's also a really food friendly wine, which is one of the reasons that I love this winery. I should also note, um, you know, if you're looking to just try a Spotswood wine, which I think is one of the great iconic classic benchmark producers, that was a mouthful um, of Napa Valley. You know, Spotswood is considered, uh, Robert Parker's called it, one of the first growths of Napa Valley. So he's likened it to places like Chateau Margaux in Bordeaux. Um, there really just is a, a quality of wine there um, that remains unsurpassed. And I think the word classic is something that we go back to. And so the Sauvignon Blanc uh, is sort of an entry point for those who are interested in maybe trying something from the Spotswood family. Another thing that they make, which I think is really delicious and at, an, at another sort of accessible price point because their Cabernets can be quite expensive, um, upwards of about $200 to $300 a bottle. Um, they do make a wine called the Spotswood Lindenhurst. And that is a sort of second label. They have a little bit of purchased fruit from around the route valley, but there is also some estate fruit in there and it's all made by the same team. Um, and I always love that vintage to vintage. It's a great, it's a great wine, um, sub $100 price point that I think is wonderful. And there's one other that I'm blanking on the name, but they make like an Albarino and they make, uh, what are some of the other wild varieties? They're not from the estate, but it's a second sort of second label. And I'm like, I can envision the label, but I'm, I'm totally blanking on the name. Um, I wanna get to this Dominus because holy moly, how often do I get to have Dominus? Um, I wonder how many of you have gotten to have Dominus. This is 2016 Dominus. Uh, yeah, this is the 100 pointer. This is a, I believe it's a hundred pointer. I am 99% sure it's a hundred pointer. I probably should have double checked that. Um, Dominus, where do we begin with Dominus? Well, I think the first important fact about Dominus is that it was founded by Christian Moex, who is of the Moex family from Bordeaux, most famously known for a little winery called Chateau Petrus, P-E-T-R-U-S. And if you've never heard of Chateau Petrus, it's one of the iconic wines, not only in Bordeaux, but in the world. Um, and I am really excited to taste this wine today because to me, Dominus has always been a wine that still has some of those Bordeaux sensibilities. Interestingly, when Christian founded this, this winery, um, let's see, the first vintage was 1983. Um, but I believe he was here in the seventies. And this was actually part, part of, I believe what was originally the Inglenook estate. Um, this is 100% Yamfil fruit. This is all estate. Though you'll notice that on the label, it does not say Yamfil. It just says Napa Valley. That's always been the case. Um, they have been dry farming this vineyard for, I think, almost since the beginning. And in fact, if you are lucky enough to go to, to Dominus, which is a, a very rare occasion, um, they don't post anyone except for trade. Um, I actually have some footage from when I went there. I should try to upload that. Um, they only, uh, they only let people like sommeliers come and visit, uh, which is really, really unique. They have a beautiful, uh, architecturally stunning building that they have the winery, uh, where the winery is. Um, but it's all in the Western foothills of Yountville, which is about midway into the valley on the, on the left-hand side, if you're driving and it's such you know, incredible family and pedigree behind this label, but you also have an amazing, uh, amazing vineyard. Um, so it's telling me my connection is unstable. That sucks. Well, hopefully it'll come back. see. Oh, I'm back. Okay, cool. Um, sorry, guys. Uh, yes. Okay. So I just poured the dominance in my glass. I don't know where I was in talking, but I will say um, this is the 2016 dominance. And like I said, dry farms. And oh, I think I was talking about if you ever visited the winery. Um, it in the winery, they have one of the original vines that they had to yank out and the the root of the vine literally spans like eight feet across it's wild to see um 
Uh, hi, Amanda, can you explain the Dominus Petrus again? Yes. Um, good question. So Petrus is in Bordeaux on the right bank in uh, a region that is mostly Merlot dominant. So um, while the Moyax family is uh, makes Petrus, Christian Moyax, uh, this is his wine. This is Dominus. And this is a Bordeaux blend from Napa Valley. So a wine from the family, but not from Bordeaux, from Napa Valley. It is on a, in an estate in Yountville. Uh, on the Western side, as I explained, completely dry farmed um, and mostly Cabernet dominant. Um, interestingly, there is no Merlot in this wine. So for a family that is known for making one of the best wines and specifically Merlots in the world, there is no Merlot and Dominus, which I've always found really interesting. Um, but anyway, so I, I think it's really fascinating that these, this vineyard is dry farmed. They've got these, these vines with like, with tails. I mean, they just like span the entire width of the room. It's, it's wild to see. Um, but it's important because it, it means that the vine is healthy. It means it's, it's, it's resistant to a lot of the, the critters that some of the other vines in Napa Valley are susceptible to because they kind of climb up to the, to the top of the soil. Um, but it also makes for a far more nuanced wine, right? Like the deeper your vines go, the better quality the grape is going to be, or so the scientists tell us. Um, I will say for as Bordelais as this wine has always been, I find the 2016 to be a little bit on the riper side for me. Um, this wine was available via wine access. Actually, both of these wines are. And interestingly, their drinking window, which we discussed today on the podcast, uh, has a starting window of 2022. Now today it is 2020. So what does that mean? Um, and it was a good question that, that our guest asked us. Um, and, and an important question because, you know, if a drinking window starts at 2022, why are we drinking it in 2020? Well, I think, you know, for Dominus, that is sort of the optimal drinking window. This is a wine that is incredibly high quality and incredibly nuanced. And while it is very delicious, and I'll get to taste of your wine in just a second, while it is very delicious right now, the beauty of this wine, I mean, the true beauty is not really unearthed for another few years. And I say that because it takes time for wines to develop and start, as, as we've talked about before, it takes some time for some of that those top layers to start to peel off and those little nuances that you don't find in every wine start to come through. So while you know a lot of young Napa Valley cabs or um, young wines in general, you know they can be a little bit more homogenized in their youth. And I think that's a function of just baby fat, right? Like all babies are cute. All young Napa Valley wines are delicious. It's a huge blanket statement that I might get in trouble for, but I think there is sort of a parallel there. And so as these wines age, you know, as that baby fat starts to remove itself, as other things come into play, that's really what you're paying the money for. And so that's why, you know, drinking windows of 2022 exist because the reality is you're not getting the optimal bang for your buck in 2020. It really isn't going to come through for another five to 10 years. So as we think about wines like Dominus that are very expensive, that are very high quality, you know, you have to think about, you know, why this wine might be delicious right now, but was it the appropriate time you drink? Now it's very delicious. And I'll, I'll explain to you why it's very delicious. But I think that the real reason someone should be drinking this wine uh, and the, the real way to experience this wine is not for another few years. So for example, like on the nose, it's pretty sun-kissed. Like this is, this is smelling pretty ripe. Um, so the quality of this fruit, very dark, a little bit more on the black side of things, more raspberries, blackberries, cassis, very classic Cabernet, very classic Napa Valley Cabernet. But the quality of the fruit is very ripe. It's kind of bouncy. There is something underneath of it that feels a little bit savory, feels a little bit more like olive. Uh, there's a little bit of rosemary. I was just uh, prepping dinner uh, for later. I was, I was picking some tarragon and some rosemary. You know, I smell a little bit of my hands, but I also smell them in the glass, which I think is, is a testament to the quality of the wine that's in this glass. Now, as you look for other things, you can kind of feel that they're there, but it won't be for another few years that you really start to dive into them. And I have had the luxury of having some of the older versions, the older vintages of these wines at present. So you guys have probably seen um, you know, we taste like the 1991 Dominus, which for me is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite wines, not just in Napa Valley, but in the world. I mean, truly an extraordinary wine. Um, but today, you know, that wine is to me and it's, it's in its prime drinking window. I have no idea what it tasted like in 1994 or whatever it was released. Um, but for me, that is why I would pay 
the money for that bottle of wine is because in right now that what is that 30 year uh, almost 30 year old bottle of wine is just perfectly in its drinking window um i believe market is demanding wines ready to drink pay 200 and wait 10 years doesn't make sense um sorry i'm trying to decipher yeah, I think um, it's, a, it's a good point. The market does demand wines ready to drink. And I think that's a function of what style of Napa Valley wines, uh, Napa Valley, the style of wines that Napa Valley was making uh, and continues to make, which is more ready to drink. And I think, you know, that that's a conversation perhaps for another day, but maybe we can dive into a little bit, you know, from about 2002 or 1998, if you want to, or 1997, if you really want to go back that far, 1997 till current day, that is the, the time when Napa Valley really pushed things forward and got to a place where they were looking for ripeness, they were looking for soft tannins, they were looking for wines that were ready to drink because effectively that's what the consumer was demanding. And so um, to your point, uh, the market does demand that as a result of the style that Napa Valley essentially put into place many, many years ago. Um, so to pay $200, again, to your point, and wait 10 years, it doesn't really make sense to many American consumers. And to be fair, a lot of the wines that have been made over the last 10, 20 years in Napa Valley, especially in that $200 bracket and higher, they don't, they haven't aged in the way that, say, Bordeaux has aged. They haven't aged in the way that maybe the 1991 Dominus has aged. You know, those wines are a little bit riper. Um, they had less acidity. The tannins were far more integrated. And so the shelf life on those wines from an aging perspective may not be as long. I think it's maybe too soon to tell and I don't want a blanket statement. And I certainly don't want to um, tell anyone not to age their 2013 Napa Cabernet because I think there will be longevity just in a different way. I also just think it's maybe too soon to tell, but. For this 2016 Dominus, you know, for as ripe as this wine presents on the nose and as ripe as it is on the palate, there is something so subtle and dark and savory. And it, it it's so interesting because you think this wine is gonna just like, it's going to hit your palate and it's going to like kind of sit there and it's going to be, you know, really dense and it's going to feel like, you know, it smells like a dessert, right? It feels like you're going to take a big bite of like a blackberry cobbler. But when you sip this wine for the first time, you get all of those flavors, but you don't get the denseness. You don't get that heaviness that you would get from a, a different, uh, from a style of, uh, from a Napa Valley wine that maybe has a different style that, that is a little bit more extracted. This has restraint and it sort of pulls back. There's almost a salinity to this wine. It's really, really beautiful and interesting. Texturally, I mean, the tannins are really, really integrated and they're really fine and sandy. And you can tell that the quality of oak that was used on this wine is really, really high just based on where they're sitting on your palate. Um, but I also think that this wine is not a wine that's been heavily manipulated. It is a hot wine. Like I can feel the alcohol kind of burning right now. And I think, you know, that's something that I hope over time will start to back down a little bit. I'd, I'll be, I would be curious to see what it is on this. Yeah, I mean, it's only 14.5. It also could just be me. I'm kind of, I'm kind of hungry right now. So, um, and I was snacking on some sweets earlier. So a little, um, some like uh, kettle corn popcorners. So, you know, your palate is really uh, susceptible to the whims of what you're eating. Um, but I think, I think this wine, interestingly, has changed a little bit since I tried it a few hours ago, or at least my palate's changed for the better. Initially, I was like, oh, this is kind of soupy. Like, you know, it's a pretty extracted version of Dominus. Dominus always has uh, not an austerity to it, but it always has something that's a little bit more old world. There's, a, there's always a charm to it that I've loved about it. And since it's been made in the eighties, they've always sort of kept that style. I think in recent vintages, you've seen a little bit more intensity and a little bit more extraction perhaps. Um, but it also could just be a function of me not having had older vintages of Dominus um, in their present day. So maybe it'll evolve into something that I'm more used to now, I don't know. Um, really, really pretty dark. 
blackberry cassis um you know if we if we skip the whole uh the whole text sheet as as i did and i hope you guys enjoyed that video that i put out a few days ago you, you skip the text sheet this to me is a wine that is um a little bit more like montana in the winter fire going like you know it feels very masculine it feels very western um it feels like you should be like hopping off a horse and enjoying a little campfire sitting back grilling some meat um you know it feels very uh old americana um it doesn't feel bordelais it feel you know it, it conjures like sort of a think of like the like Ralph Lauren, like I think of a Ralph Lauren ad when I think of Dominus and, and this particular wine. Um, so like kind of like uh, Pendleton wool and fleece blankets and, you know, some just a, a comfort that's a little bit elevated and sophisticated and, you know, has a sexiness and a stealthiness to it, but, you know, feels very grounded in a way. Um, Kurt, what other producers would I compare Dominus to? Great question. Um, in Napa Valley, there are a few, and I, I think one I do definitely want to highlight, especially because he was the original winemaker at Dominus in the early 80s. So Chris Phelps was the winemaker at Dominus from about 1983 till about 1994, 1995. Um, he has a wine called Ad Vivum, A-D-V-I-V-U-M. There's a space in between Ad and Vivum. Uh, and that wine is all coming from Sleeping Lady Vineyard, which is really just kind of adjacent to the Dominus Vineyard in the Western Fault Hills of Yonville. Um, I think Chris's sensibilities, you know, whether or not it was Dominus that influenced him or he influenced Dominus, who knows. Um, but that wine in particular, I think there's a lot of through lines. It is 100% Cabernet Sauvignon, so it's not a Bordeaux blend like Dominus. Um, the other wine that I, I would highly recommend, uh, not inexpensive a la Dominus, um, I think Abreu, A-B-R-E-U, uh, Brad Grimes is making those wines. Very, very high caliber, um, hundreds of dollars a bottle, but, you know, again, from incredibly sourced vineyards and made by a guy who that's really all he does. Um, the other one would be McDonald, uh, M-A-C-D-O-N-A-L-D. Um, McDonald is really beautiful, you know, tiny little original Tokawan vineyard uh, made by uh, one of the brothers, uh, the McDonald brothers. And then not similar um, from, a, from a flavor standpoint, from, but from a style standpoint, um, Isley Vineyard. I mean, I, I for me, Isley is uh, probably one of the best, if not the best, wines being produced in Napa Valley right now. Uh, northern uh, northern end of the valley in Calistoga, now owned by the team, uh, the family for Chateau Latour. Um, you know, a little bit more floral, like, you know, where this Dominus is like more Poyac, Isley is more Margot. Um, but I think the sensibilities are still there. And I think for those that enjoy Napa wines, but really enjoy Bordeaux as well of, you know, sort of towing that line. I think Icy does a great job. Aber does a great job. Ad Vivum does a great job. You know, certainly if you want a little bit more, even more pullback, um, Maya Comis, one of the great, great classic iconic producers. It's been around since God, the forties, thirties. Um, Bob Travers took it over in the sixties. It's now owned by uh, another group who's just doing a tremendous job at stewarding the land up there on Mount Vitor. Um, you know, when you think of style, you know, kind of categorize those guys together. Um, and then Heights, you know, you, you can't forget Heights, certainly Martha's Vineyard. Again, different flavor, aromatic profile, but, you know, a, a classic old school style of Napa Valley wine um, that, that I certainly uh, have enjoyed my fair share of. So um, this wine is doing beautifully. It will be all I can do to save a little bit of it because I promised my uh, brother-in-law and sister that I would... I corrugated these, as you guys saw. Um, I promised them I would save them for when I see them next. So uh, it will be all I can do to not drink this whole darn thing. But I do have the Sauvignon Blanc, which I think would be interesting to go back to. Hmm. Still zesty. You know, I say lemon lime, but really it's like the lemon zest and the lime zest. So like a little touch of that sweetness. Hmm. Now it's like key lime pie. And now I clearly am hungry. Um, this has been super fun. Again, I apologize that it was not the rain video that I promised, but hopefully this was uh, a nice um, surprise. And thank you all for uh, for tuning into this. Um, 
I will answer your question before I go. Why some Valley, why are some Napa Valley calves like Camus moving to a sweeter taste? Love of Dominus, Berenger, Rutella, crispy, fruity, old school. Um, you know, I think uh, that is a that is a great question. Um, it is what the market dictated. It was what um, it was very clear after the the nineteen ninety seven vintage. And I and I, I encourage you to watch um, the video that I did, the Napa Valley Oldies video, where I sort of talk about what happened in that that timeline. But nineteen ninety seven was really the, the year that um, it was a hot vintage and a lot of crop, and it it spiked the sugars and it, it produced wines that had a, an, an incredible amount of ripeness and higher alcohol. Um, the scores that resulted, the, the wines that resulted, um, it really sparked a new era of Napa Valley's history. Um, but it really was motivated by uh, what the consumer wanted and what the, the critics wanted. So I think, you know, some of the wineries that have pushed extraction, pushed ripeness, um, you know, it's a result of, of consumer demand. Um, I will say, you know, you're seeing a little bit of a pullback. I, I think, you know, Kate, even Camus is sort of starting to pull back a little bit um, on how much ripeness they're trying to achieve. But Camus is a California winery and proud of it. So, um, you know, for, for Camus, I don't think you're ever going to see uh, the style that you see of something like, um, like Maya Camus. But I, I think, you know, that's a good thing. I think one of the most wonderful things about Napa Valley is there is an incredible amount of uh, stylistic differentiation and diversity. So you can have your Camuses and you can have your Dominuses. And I think that's a wonderful thing. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Any plans on bringing back $15 Friday? Uh, no plans, but I guess I could make plans. Um, that is a really tough series to do. I, um, I, I shouldn't say no plans. I have been talking to Wine Access about maybe finding a way to bring that back because they actually have quite a few wines in that under $20 category. Um, the problem is they sell out of them so darn fast uh, that it, it almost doesn't make sense. But I think, I think Kevin, I think you bring up a great point. The $15 Friday should come back and there's so many great $15 wines out there. Um, why not? So I'll tell you what, I'll put it on my agenda. I will put it on my ever growing list. I will move it to the top and I'll make it a priority. So there you go. Uh, guys, this has been super fun. Thank you for tuning in to uh, what should have been a rain video that turned into a dominance and spots. But again, just to refresh your memory, uh, if you're just joining us, we did 2018 Spotswood. I'm sorry for the crazy light. Uh, and then also the 2016 Dominus uh, today. So I hope you enjoyed this. I may or may not be live tomorrow. It depends on Carlo and his internet Wi-Fi situation, but um, I hope to uh, I hope to see you at some point, um, either tomorrow or on Friday. Um, am I planning on being a Somali in any other restaurant? I am not at this time planning on being a Somali in any other restaurant. I am uh, full-time doing creator stuff, hosting a podcast and staying very, very busy doing that. So um, no, not at, at this time. It's also a hard time to be a sommelier in a, in a restaurant with everything going on. You know, it's not a, I, I, I feel for my team that is at press right now. It is very difficult um, with all, all that's going on. And unfortunately they just closed indoor dining in Napa Valley again and restaurants are, you know, continuing to shut up, shut down again. Um, so, you know, not a great time to be any, any hospitality person, um, but certainly not a sommelier. So I, I am very content to be doing what I'm doing right now. and very thankful that I have people like you guys to shoot in and watch. Um, thank you. Uh, oh, thank you for sending up for Viticol. I love Viticol. I'm looking forward to my next shipment. And in fact, I actually have a bottle of like, um, what is it? The, it's a Grenache, I forget. Um, anyway, I, I digress. Thank you guys for watching. I'm going to go eat dinner because I'm clearly delusional.